thanks so much for having me. Like both said, we met over dinner and um, super great guy. I was pleased to meet him. It was an awesome event. I would encourage people if you aren't getting out and physically going to networking events, um, it's probably the most powerful thing in my real estate investing world right now is the relationships I have. And I've met these people um, by taking action and showing up. So Bo included. He kind of talked about my story briefly. Um, I'm really looking to build needed infill housing, long-term build and hold strategy. So I have a, a construction background. I've been a general contractor off and on for almost 30 years. I built my first ADU in 1996 as a high school student. Um, my woodshop teacher took handpicked a, a few kids. We thought we were special. Really, he just knew we were delinquents and we were going to go nowhere. And he formed a construction technology class. And we built an illegal ADU for another one of our teachers. Um, college wasn't for me. Uh, I got right into the trades. I started an apprenticeship in high school. I got my license right after high school. And, you know, in the late um, 90s in Oregon, if you could, you know, fog glass, you could get a contracting license. So that's kind of how my story started. I have a goal of having the most amount of cash flow with the least amount of units. So there's no ego here. There's no scaling of I need 100 doors or I need to be a billionaire. I want to not have to worry about money. And I wanted I wanted to not have to worry about money. And I wanted to be able to run and ski and quit my job as a fireman. Like that's all I really wanted when I started. It's evolved into something that's um, way bigger than I ever thought it would be. Uh, I talk about ADUs all day long with people all over the country. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm that ADU guy. I'm probably most active there. I post everything I'm doing. I'm always building something or taking care of some problem at a house. Um, I've got a YouTube channel, uh, that ADU guy there as well, where I kind of open source everything I'm building. So I'll talk about that a little bit as we go on. Uh, but that's just a brief overview of me. I'm 42. I've got a couple kids, uh, awesome family life, and I have time freedom. I recently retired from the fire department and I thought, okay, I'm going to run and ski all day. And then I just realized I was bored. So I've been on a buying spree. I'm buying, I bought, I've got under contract on four different pieces of land right now that I'm going to be developing and um, kind of have a second win. So fingers crossed, you know, Warren Buffett says, be greedy when everybody else is fearful. Like right now is that time. So I'm going to go through a quick slide deck. Uh, it's about 35 slides of a basic overview of the strategy, some different types of ADUs. Try to keep that at under 30 minutes because realistically, what I want to do is answer every personal question you have. Like, how do I convert my garage? Um, we've got teachers, nurses, realtors here. This is a very average strategy. I call it the slow, simple, sure path to wealth um, one at a time. So we'll get right to it. Share my screen and uh, if you have a, a burning question, just throw it out there. If not, um, wait till we're done. And so that's me. That's what I'm doing. That's where you can find me. Um, my kind of main spot is that aduguy.com. Bo mentioned some free plans under the resources tab. Uh, I have two free sets of plans that we actually got pre-approved in our city and our county and gave away so people can come in uh, and, and actually take those away from the city for free and start their project. They're obviously not going to be pre-approved down in California, but you can you can have those plans um, for budgeting purposes. You may have to have them stamped by an engineer in your state. So house hacking into the buy and hold strategy and what I teach and what I preach and what I do is um, the, the house hack, which to me, in my definition is making money, some sort of income stream off of your primary residence. And primary residence is really important because everybody here that I saw with exception to Mississippi is in, and that could be a very high market too, but I know the Bay area is a very high value market. So is Southern Oregon where I'm at. So house hacking is important because we can go into these five, six, seven, eight, nine million dollar houses with, you know, three and a half, five percent down conventional lending. And then we're looking to build some sort of income stream on that house. It could be renting out um, your pasture. It could be renting out your garage as air conditioned storage for your neighbor down the street to park their boat in. It could be building an ADU in your backyard. So the, the strategy that I focus on is obviously ADUs. Um, I try to build standalone detached ADUs and I'll, I'll cover uh, more of that in the design. But house hacking is, is really just buying a primary house with 5% down for our newer people. You stay there. You have to intend to occupy it for a year. It takes about a year to build an ADU. And then you 
you don't sell and do a move up purchase. You just keep that, put it under a 12 month long-term lease, and then you can qualify for a new primary mortgage with no change to your DTI. As long as it cash flows one cent more than the debt service on it, you can go get another loan. And you do that once a year and you're adding an ADU to each one. I mean, in five years, you have 10 units. I mean, if I'm half wrong, it takes 10 years and, and you're at retirement. So I had a goal to hit, um, I wanted 10 units that we're going to average net net cash flow of a thousand a month. I thought I'll live like a king on 10 grand a month. Um, and I overshot my goal. I, I'm up to um, quite a few more units than that and counting. But the, the point being is, is you don't need very many. If you can net a thousand dollars a unit and your expenses, because you control your spending are six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month, you don't need that many units and that's not that many years. So stuff to kind of keep in mind as we we roll through this. Everybody here knows what an ADU is. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure if you don't raise a hand, but it's it's really just a smaller second or third unit on a single family lot that was primarily designated for one house. The A in ADU is the most important part is it's accessory to the primary. Um, so not to be confused with multiple properties on a multifamily zone. What's really cool about the, the ADU strategy is we're looking for single family residences and single family zones, and then we're house hacking or land hacking our way into a multifamily strategy. So the benefit there is we get this product that's super high demand and low supply. You get this small custom house when all your competition is multifamily and apartments. So uh, usually, and this isn't meant to be derogatory, but usually single family neighborhoods um, are a little more desirable because there's usually less traffic. There can be less train tracks, less crime, stuff like that. Another reason that the A and the accessory is important is because we can tie into the utilities of the primary house as opposed to like tapping into the sewer main out in the street that's six feet down under asphalt. We can tie into the sewer lateral private line right in front of the main house. So everything's a lot cheaper. Uh, we're we're going to use them to build wealth by just building them and holding them forever. So some places are going to be midterm rentals. That's a big thing. You know, Bo brought up, um, you know, 30, 30, minimum 30 day stays and midterm rentals and putting these on furnished finder and traveling nurses. Um, I choose to, to, pretty much exclusively focus on long-term uh, market rate rentals, but there's lots of different options. Short-term rentals are a big one. They've been really hot. If you follow AirDNA or you're tracking short-term rentals, everybody just absolutely made a heyday out of that strategy from pretty much 2020 to spring of last year. Um, market sentiment has shifted in a lot of markets and there's a lot of pain in short-term rentals right now. Uh, as a legislator and as a planning commissioner in the past, I know that we as legislators at times do not like short-term rentals. The, the whole idea that we've allowed ADUs, uh, this infill housing, and we've we've come up with overarching ADU strategy and, and ADU legislation, which by the way, California has the best ADU legislation in the country right now, uh, is because there's a housing crisis and we need really workforce, not like affordable housing. There's nothing affordable about housing unless it's subsidized, but it's it's more units. And when we rent those out short term to people that are coming into town, it doesn't solve the problem that we legislated to approve them for. I don't have anything against short term rentals. I mean, do the best you can to recoup your investment. I'm an investor, right? And I want you to be too. Just know the regulations if you're going to build this for short term purposes. Um, and know that legislators don't like them. And there's a huge legislative headwind against short term rentals. So I'm going to go over the four major stages of your ADU. And uh, we can talk about a few different things when we're done with this. Um, this is more for building or converting an ADU. I'll say right now, this is probably the top three most important things I'll say tonight. The cheapest and easiest and most efficient way to build or convert an ADU is to buy a property that already has one. So you eliminate construction, you eliminate all this stuff I'm going to talk about. You eliminate planning, designing, financing, building, if you can buy a property that already has an ADU or my, my favorite trade secret right now is to buy a house at a discount that's been marketed and priced as a house with an ADU that doesn't have a legal permitted ADU because you become an expert in your zoning code and you know that, and then you can negotiate a lower price for that house and then get it permitted. So be looking for houses with legacy ADUs or 
um, studios. When I'm searching for property, some keywords I use are um, bonus room. I use studio. I use office space. It's usually the last picture or two in the listings where you get a little glimpse of like an unfinished basement. And in the corner of the picture, you can see like a hot plate. So little things like that. You know, I'm looking for houses that have illegal ADUs that just need to get permitted. Uh, just a little hot tip there. So planning in, uh, in this whole sphere of what it takes to build or convert infill housing, this is the most important slide. It's boring. Um, I'd never seen a any social media post ever about zoning. And so I recently did one um, and it wasn't very popular. But the planning and zoning language is the rule book of how we make money in real estate, folks. So when I say become an expert in your local zoning code, all I mean is like, can you build an ADU or convert an ADU where you live? If you're looking to go buy a house in um, Pittsburgh and you're in the city limits of Pittsburgh, can you build an ADU there? Uh, if you want to, you know, we have a, uh, a teacher that just talked earlier uh, in the intros and he said, I built a, a mother-in-law unit and I want to build um, a, a permitted ADU. What are, the, what are the codes in your area? What are the side setbacks? Um, what are the parking requirements? That all That's all I mean when I say become an expert. So the, the tips I would give to becoming an expert in your local zoning code as it pertains to ADUs is um, just calling, emailing, and going into, I like the three-legged approach. So if you can call your local planning and zoning office, you're in Walnut Creek, I would just Google Walnut Creek planning and zoning. You'll, you know, it'll pop up the city website. You'll get a, some phone number for the planning office and call them and leave a message if you can get a hold of somebody, you don't, you may not need to email or go in, but I always like to get what I, what I'm going to do uh, in writing. So I like that email. And then I always like to go in and make face-to-face -face because we're building relationships with the decision makers. And the hardest part about the ADU is getting past the planning and zoning goalies. I call them. Once you get building permits in hand, the building department is, and this is nationwide. I, I talk to people all over the country every day and, and my experience as well, of building ADUs and over almost 30 years now is the building department's a slam dunk. Like that's the easy part. So become an expert in your local planning, uh, planning and zoning code. I usually just say, um, if you, if you're savvy, you can go into the code yourself, but if you're, if you're not just send that email, Hey, I'm looking to build an ADU at one, two, three Adams road and Walnut Creek. Can you please send me the standards? And this is stuff that you can do yourself. There's two ways to get an ADU. There's the, I want an ADU now, damn it, person who has more time uh, or excuse me, more money than time. And they just want to pay for it all. And they can have an architect do all that. And then there's the more savvy investor who wants to drive yield by doing more of the work themselves. So you can do all this legwork. You don't have to be an architect. A lot of planning departments also have pre-approved plans. So one of the, the, the lady with the master's degree in construction management talked about how much more custom building is. And that is very true. But if your city has a simple pre-approved set of plans that would look okay based on the architectural uh, design of your house, consider using those because they save you a lot of time and money. One thing I see kill deals occasionally, you don't have to worry about this in California because there's legislation that says you can't require cities can't require an occupancy requirement but in some states they're allowing adus but you have to live in the primary house so in other words you can't stack these up so be be advised of kind of hidden uh, hidden rules like that i'll go over the couple of different types of adus that that we're going to do i mean there's really only five different types of adu there's variations of each but we'll look at attached detached garage conversions above garage the carve out, which a basement is a carve out. But every time I don't put basement in my slideshow, everybody says, what about a basement ADU? And, and really that would be an internal carve out ADU as well. So attached ADUs are exactly what they sound like. They're attached, just think like a shared wall duplex. Um, we do have some strategies uh, and one of the markets I invest in, you can do two ADUs, but one of them has to be attached. And because I know that tenants want the same three things that owners want in a house, and that's they want uh, location, they want privacy and amenities. And it's hard to get that privacy piece for your tenants if it's attached. So I've been building these, uh, this white one here. This is a, a garage that's actually six feet away from the, the main house, but it's attached with a breezeway. So there's some tricks to doing attached, detached. 
units. Um, this lower corner unit is uh, an old historic house that was converted into a attached ADU. So realistically, a, a side-by-side -side duplex is a good example of an attached ADU. Uh, the detached ADU is going to cost a little bit more money, but it's kind of the cream of the crop. It's Again, it's the product that I'm looking to provide that's really low supply and high demand. It's a small custom house, but everything else that's one bedroom, one bath in the same price range is like a shared wall over under apartment. So you can really just knock out the competition when you have something that doesn't compete. Garage conversion ADUs are really popular in California. I just did a garage conversion. I get so many calls on garage conversions. I recently bought this last year, I bought a property uh, in my market and did a full video of pretty much every step of the phase. There's a playlist on my YouTube channel called Garage Conversion ADU. And I went over um, it pretty much in detail, like how I cut the concrete slab, how I put in all the plumbing, patched the concrete back up, framed in the walls, put the bathroom in. Anyways, if you're interested in that kind of open source garage conversion ADU, you can check it out there. Above garage ADUs are a great strategy when you have to meet the same parking. So a lot of state laws don't require additional off-street parking for your ADU, but what they do pretty much all require is that you do meet the two spots that are mandated for the primary house. So pretty much every single family zone in the nation has a, a kind of model code of you need two off-street parking spots for a single family house. So if those qualify as the garage spots and you're going to convert those garage spots to parking, sometimes you may have to find two parking spots, say nine by 19, somewhere else on the property. And if you can't do that, an awesome option is an above garage ADU. And granted, they're a lot easier on new construction. So every house that I build new construction, the ADU, uh, the garage gets an ADU above it, period. If you have an existing house and you want to pull the top off of your current garage and go up, it's not as easy. But if you're ever looking at newer construction or new construction, always consider an ADU above the garage because you get your parking and your space. And then this is the cheapest, most affordable version that I turn all my first time home buyers onto. It's where you buy a monster house. You buy a big old ugly house like this. Um, I pulled up to this house. I'd never been inside of it. And I knew that this was going to be the ADU. And turns out this, this left wing of this house in the top left-hand corner was a second. It was like a second living room and a, a second formal dining room. And it was a really, really easy and affordable ADU conversion. Uh, one of the cheapest ones I've ever done. It was less than $30,000. Basically put in this one wall kitchen on the right, put a little loft in above the bathroom area. And it's a 500 square foot unit. And the, the house is still a 3-2. So we didn't lose any bedrooms off of the house. Um, we pulled the permits, literally just walled off a couple of hallways and fire lined them with two layers of type X drywall soundproof that shared wall. If you're going to do a conversion, it's really important that you pay attention to sound and vibration transfer. So I don't do over unders personally, just because I think it's too close to multifamily. If you have, you know, an unfinished basement or you're buying a property and an over under is your only option. Um, I'm not saying it's a deal killer or a no go. Just make sure you educate yourself on good principles of sound dampening. Uh, there's um, a website called Soundproof Cow, and you can go really deep into rabbit holes on like how to soundproof your rooms and your house. The technique I use is two layers of 5 8 Type X drywall with a layer of green glue soundproofing compound between the two. And that gives a, a good sound reduction layer. Basement conversions are great um, if that's your only option. A lot of times people think they're easy because they already have the square footage. I just bought a 3,000 square foot house, but 1,500 of it is unfinished downstairs. I'm just going to double the size of my house. It'll be perfect. If there's a bathroom in it and there's already an egress window, that could be true. But those are the two things I see really cost a lot of time and money and brain damage on basement conversions is you need you know 5.7 square feet of clear open space for an egress window to get out of any sleeping room. And then all the plumbing that's in the floor of the main house. And when you look up in a basement, well, that's the ceiling of that basement. And so you're going to, a lot of times have to pump your, your black water. You're going to have to pump your waistlines up 
high enough to catch grade to drain out to the street. If you have a basement that already has a bathroom in it, that's a different story and that's a slam dunk. So infrastructure is really where I kind of focus in. So when I buy properties, I'd never get a deal. Um, I've been buying some off-market properties lately. I don't get a deal. They're all market rate or more. I pay for an anomaly that I see. There's there's something in the code that's going to allow me to exploit this property to the upside of adding housing. And the other thing that I really look at is the infrastructure. So a house that's really, really competitively priced that was built in the 40s that has a bad sewer line that has cast plumbing in the house and galvanized water lines and an asbestos roof. I mean, that's that's like 70, you know, 40 to $70,000 negative to me. I'm more looking to pay retail for something that was built like after the late seventies that I know has plastic plumbing and it has copper pipes and it has an upgraded panel with real Romex wiring. Like think infrastructure when you're looking to build an ADU or even convert an ADU. It's, it's so um, overlooked because you can't see it. So like, what is the actual quality of the structure of the house and the infrastructure? Another one that I, I kind of lump into infrastructure is what is the grade of the property? So if we live on a slope and we want to build an ADU, we don't get all these niceties. But if we're looking, we're an investor trying to find our next deal or our first house, try to buy something that's on a fairly flat lot. Uh, you want something that has parking. Ideally, it's going to be near you know, power, it's going to be, there's already natural gas in the area, things like that. So infrastructure, think like a developer, even though you may just be converting a basement, you have to think like a developer. So think about infrastructure. These are some uh, things that I, I talk about often when you're doing an ADU, whether legal or legacy is, is there going to, there's going to be some shared assets, you know, are you going to share part of the yard? Um, most jurisdictions have you uh, designate a separate address. It might be 123A and 123B. Sometimes you can share mailboxes. Sometimes the postmaster won't let you add a mailbox. These are all like weird little things that you would never think of that take up a lot of time uh, in your project. And then utilities, you know, I share utilities on all my units by privately metering them. And what I do is I put private digital meters off of the main public meter at the house. And then I follow the utility and exchange commission laws on billing back to our tenants, which basically says we don't charge them any more than we're being charged. And then we can tell our tenants, hey, pay for whatever utilities you use and use whatever utilities you need to be comfortable. As opposed to most of my competition, they don't privately meter the utilities. They just say there's a flat rate, 1500 bucks a month for rent, and it's 300 bucks a month for utilities. What if you're conservative? And you don't use a lot of utilities and you don't turn the AC, you know, to Antarctica and then leave the windows open. You, you don't get any benefit. So I like to empower my tenants and let them control their own utilities. And I do that with utility sharing. Uh, designing the ADU, this is the biggest point uh, when it comes to saving money. So this is one of the top three things too that I'll say today that are probably of most importance in my opinion. Um, the three ways you're going to save money on your ADU. And this is a new build or a conversion. Start with a super simple design, self-manage the project, and do as much of the work as you possibly can yourself. So simple design, like this big engineered roof here with these beams and these hips and valleys and scuppers and all the engineering and hardware is just ridiculous. I mean, if you're building a custom home in the Oakland Hills, it's one thing. But if you're trying to put up a nice semi-custom unit in your backyard to live in so you can rent your house, you don't want to spend $25,000 on a roof system that you could have done with $1,800 in trusses. So simple design. This is a picture here to remind myself that too. Design principles of an ADU. Again, we're in a small space. Uh, the accessory piece of the ADU usually comes with a classification of max designation of space. So for instance, very common language is your ADU can be 800 square feet or 75% of the primary house's square footage, whichever smaller. Some zones I've seen them get up to 1500 feet, but most of the time nationwide, they're like a thousand square feet or less. So in these small spaces, we maximize them by using big open wall windows. Um, I pretty much always use a single one wall galley kitchen 
So we're trying to like keep the space as open as we can. Really light, bright colors, vaulted ceilings. This is one of my um, ADUs that's a free set of plans on my website. And it's got a big, tall vaulted ceiling, light colors, windows on every wall aspect. If we can um, point our windows or if you're just converting your garage um, to an ADU, Think about where the sun goes. Think about where your neighbors are. You know, you don't want to look into your neighbor's kitchen window, but you also don't want to put all your windows on the shady side of the house. Try to put your windows on the west walls, things like that. Just basic common sense when it comes to designing. Storage is important because there's not a lot of it in a small space. So one of my favorite ADU designs on these new standalones that I build is having some loft space upstairs. I know in my area, my tenant, most of them are nurses and teachers. They have seasonal outdoor gear and they seem to all have a bike and a kayak. So I need about 50 square feet of storage and it's got to fit a 12 foot kayak. So I just decided to start putting these lofts in my units and it kind of solves all that. Um, pocket doors are another uh, really cool, affordable, simple design standard that I use in my ADU. So you walk in the front door of this ADU and if it's a studio, it feels way bigger, but tenants don't want studios. They want to have a bedroom. So when they have guests over, they're not all sitting down in their room. So what I've done to, to get the studio feel is I use uh, double three O pocket doors. So these are two, three foot pocket doors. And when they're both open, which means they're slid into the wall, this is a big six foot opening. So when you walk in the front door, you look all the way through the ADU and it's only 24 feet deep, but if you were to walk in and look through the, just the front room and, and visually stop at that wall of 12 feet, even with the tall vaulted ceilings, it would really close that space down. So pocket doors are nice because they don't take up any space and you can make walls look open when really they can, they can close as well. A few more slides, guys. Funding. Um, I should have just updated this. It just says start with calling Bo. Uh, there's a lot of different options for funding your ADU. I call it the financial stack and I say fund your ADU with any means possible. Some common ways people are funding ADUs. I mean, a year ago, I would have said suck out your equity with a cash out refi. Um, now I would say look more at a second. So if you've owned a home the last few years and you weren't asleep, you probably have a rate around 3%. And today rates are at six and a half percent. That's like top tier owner occupancy rates. So why would you refi your whole house to pull out the money you need for the ADU and reset your whole note at six and a half percent? You probably wouldn't. So look at a second mortgage um, to tap some of that equity. There's construction loans. Some things that I've seen people do and I coach people on is tapping into your employer sponsored 401k, 403b, stuff like that, where you can... A lot of plans will let you pull 50 grand or 50% out of that and pay yourself back with interest over 60 months. Uh, consider an applicable federal rate loan. And the applicable federal rate is the minimum interest allowable by the IRS on a family loan to not count as a gift. So if you have a rich family member, you can present them with these plans. Hey, look, it's going to cost me 100 grand to build this ADU. The appraiser across town that I paid $200 to review this said it's probably going to appraise for around 200. Could you lend me the money at 3.1%? So get creative when it comes to funding your ADU. California, uh, you Walnut Creek people, um, North Bay, East Bay, I would look at Redwood Credit Union. Redwood Credit Union has the best product that I've heard of nationally. Um, they have, I think it's a 9010 LTV construction loan product. And there's a some kind of grant in California that pays for that other 10%. So it's basically 100% bridge and long-term funding on your ADU. I've heard they've gotten a bunch of traffic and they're not producing a lot of these loans, even though they have the product. But I would call them. I would also call small local banks and credit unions in your area. Not like Chase Bank or Rocket. I, I'm thinking like small banks with you know one or two branches. Think of a small parking lot. Uh, call people that you've banked with for a long time. You know, if you have a credit union that you've been with for 20 years, call them and ask them what's the best product you have. It could be a combination of a second with a personal loan with a renovation loan. So get creative. All lenders are not created equally. I'll tell you right now that lenders are calling me more than they've ever called me. And I think it's 
because like we're trying to create new products and keep everybody busy. Like people are getting creative to make it work. So if you have, um, uh, you know, the, the one of the number one mistakes I see people make is they over design and over build their ADU and then they go to burr their money back out or or refi finance their money back out and they don't get but half of it. It's because they over designed and over built. But if you have a simple design and you're in a high rent market area, like pretty much everybody on this call is, it's really easy to get most, if not all of your money back out when you stabilize these long term. So that's kind of the long of the short of funding. Uh, again, like I said earlier, the best way to finance an ADU is at purchase. And just recently, seven months ago, Freddie and Fannie federal regulation decided to allow accessory dwelling unit income, 75% of it to count towards DTI of the borrower, which never was allowed before. And now they're treating ADUs in the conventional lending world as similar to duplexes where that income can count. So another trick I tell people, especially new investors, if you're qualified for 500,000, um, you may be qualified for 700,000 if that house has an ADU. So purchasing at today's standards, if you're qualified for 500, you could get up to almost 800 if it has a decent ADU that you can rent for, for market rate. So there's tremendous value in this strategy. Obviously cash, liquid assets, borrow money from your friends, call Bo, he's got lots of money. Get the money however you can. That's how we build ADUs. And what I'm doing now currently is I use home equity lines of credit. So I've built up, um, you know, a system and I've built up some surplus and I've got some big HELOCs on properties. So now I just pull HELOCs. It's, it's adjustable rate, but it's from my local credit union. And I'm able to just build these, either the houses or the ADUs or both. And then when they're done, put long-term fixed rate debt on it. So again, kind of rinse and repeat that money. I don't always recommend hard money for an ADU just because things can go wrong and they can take longer. And I, and I don't like to see people lose money from predatory lending. Um, so if you're going to do hard money, just make sure there's a track record on both sides. Can the hard money um, come through and can you perform to pay them back? Again, rental loans, construction loans, creative loans, call Bo. Credit cards, I've seen people build ADUs on two different credit cards, um, high rate, no interest till the next year credit cards and basically build ADUs for free. I haven't done that. I don't, I'm not an expert in credit card hacking, but it can be done. And then building the ADU uh, is kind of the fun part. General contracting, whether DIY. So when I say self-manage the project, that doesn't mean you're going to swing a hammer or you're going to be digging this ditch that's 48 inches deep for this utility line here. Um, it means, can you make a decision? Can you be decisive? Can you handle conflict? Can you um, keep a schedule? Can you stay on time? Things like that. That's how um, that's how you manage a, a project and save 30 to 40%. If you have more time than money, I would say don't bother and just hire somebody to do it, but make sure you vet your contractor. Even if your contractor comes to you through somebody you know, like, and trust, ask them for references and call that contractor's references. Anybody right now in this market that doesn't have three references to give you in like five seconds is obviously got something to hide and good contractors can't wait to give you their references. So when they give you the references, just call them. I can't tell you how many people embark on these, you know, six figure projects and they never even call references. And then halfway through the job, they're like, my contractor, you know, screwed me. And it's like, no, you screwed yourself. So do your own due diligence there. The permitting process is getting easier and easier. I heard a couple of people say they were here to learn and how is it to permit these? Um, you can pay an architect to do all this stuff for you, or you can become an expert in your local zoning code by calling your planning and zoning office and saying, hey, I want to build an ADU. Um, what is the process like? Could a normal homeowner like me get through this process? Has anybody done that lately? Do you guys have any workshops? Do you guys have any classes? Just start building the relationships with the decision makers. But this stuff is not rocket science, guys. I mean, most average people are more patient, uh, are more intelligent, have better administration skills than, than most builders, myself included. Okay. So don't sell yourself short. A couple things that we'll end here with is, um, is access. So when, when we're building or converting ADUs in our backyard, um, make sure we design to our area. So if you, you design an ADU that has these big 30 foot long trusses, but you can't get them behind your house, or 
Um, you're going to do a foundation, a crawl space foundation ADU where you've got to dig out like 40 yards of dirt, where you're going to get the dirt kind of kind of dump truck, get back there. Those are little things that I see people trip up on. They nail everything and then they start the build process and they're like, holy shit, how am I going to get my concrete behind my house? Or how am I going to get all this dirt out? It sounds odd, but people make that mistake a lot. I get these calls every day. Electric um, utilities are usually free. So if you're just in the early planning stages of building or converting an ADU, you may need to upgrade your power. So call your local public utility or private utility and have them come out and do a site survey and tell you if you have enough amperage for power. And then I also do that for gas. Um, water, you can pretty much run two or three ADUs off a single three quarter standard residential water meter that's already uh, installed on your street. And then the most important part of the process is holding the ADU. So I always talk about building property management into my builds and conversions. And this is like, the, all my ADUs look identical. They look just like this. I use real nail down hardwood floor, uh, granite countertops, tile in the bathroom. Um, I use pipe fitting, towel bar hardware. I just want everything to be really durable and hard all the light fixtures I have extras of, all the, the plumbing fixtures I have extras of. If somebody has a leaking faucet, I don't have to like think back what cartridge is that. I just have another one that I can go replace it with. The paint color is always the same. This is Whisper by Miller. It's off-white. Bathrooms are always bright white, semi-gloss. So the systematic approach, every time I go to build another one of these, I just go to my purchase again list on Amazon and and there's two sections. One is black and one is um, is uh, polished nickel. So is it a black trim package or a silver trim package? And that's the only decision I make. And I hit buy again. So by taking decision fatigue out of my design, I can make it really easy, non, no emotions, just simple. Again, you can follow me on Instagram, that ADU guy or that ADU guy.com or give me a subscribe on YouTube. Again, that ADU guy everywhere. And with that, I want to take total like drilled down specific selfish questions for people so they can build wealth. That was, that was a great presentation. It, this really opens my mind to like, I think um, looking at properties in a whole different light, like we go into a property and we might say, oh, I can buy it for, you know, X amount, I can rehab it and I can, you know, keep it or I can sell it. But I like the idea of going in and like a lot, I started buying out of state because I was like, I can't cash flow anywhere. Well, I mean, here, you know, Derek's providing a, a way where you can buy locally in very high dollar areas and cash flow. So I think it just opens your mind to like how much, how much opportunity there really is. Okay. Somebody's got their hand raised. <laughs> Elena. Elena. Yes. Um, I can't unmute myself. You're talking. We can You're hear good. you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, cool. So have you looked ever into manufactured homes? Like would yeah. it ever be worth it just to put the box or put yes. it completely done? Yes. Yes. Great question. And that was in one of the 10 bullet points that Bo had on the list. So I'm glad you brought that up. So yes, you can. We're, and you're in the California market. Okay. Yeah. So I'll give you the pros and cons of pre-manufactured versus built in place. So the pros of pre-manufactured are... Um, a, a manufactured home has a HUD stamp on it. So it's not going to have to go through the building process at all at the city because the federal government's already stamped it. Boom, done. Sorry, guys and girls. The other benefit of a manufactured home is it's not going to meet the requirements that California put on all their ADUs for the requirement of solar. And that's going to save you. And, and this isn't a solar discussion. Solar's good or bad, call it what you want, but it's it's about a 30 20 to $30,000 savings to not have to put solar on the manufactured. Another benefit of the manufactured is it's constructed off site and delivered. Okay. So you have less construction noise, less pissed off neighbors looking over the fence at you. Um, it can be more affordable. So those are the, those are kind of like the four or five pros. The rest are cons. So one of the benefits um, of one of the pros was it's, built off site and they just haul it in. Well, that's also a con. If you have a lot that's shaped like an RV park and it's got 10 concrete pads that are flat and a 20 foot driveway, those are a slam dunk. But usually ADUs aren't going on a flat concrete patio with a 20 foot approach. 
somebody wants to put them on the side of the hill behind their house between two huge trees. So that's where the limiting factors come in. Another major con to a offsite build is it may look and sound cheaper. It's like, oh, I got a quote for an ADU for $250,000. I can buy this 400 square foot Clayton home and have it delivered for 90 grand done. Well, what you don't understand is you still have to pay the same permitting fees. You have to pay the same impact fees, the same development fees. You still have to do all the site work. So a lot of the HUD requirements require that that manufactured or prefabricated dwelling be bolted down to a perimeter concrete foundation. So you still have to have a foundation, either a slab or a crawl space. You still have to trench water, sewer, power, gas, cable out there. You still have to meet all the siting and design standards. So a lot of that, that infrastructure is the hardest, is the hardest part. Tapping into the sewer of the house, trenching out there, cutting the pad, bringing in backfill, bringing in rock to compact to build on. So a lot of the work you still have to do, even though the unit comes perfect and if they just left it on the trailer in the street, you could live in it. There's still so much work and money to get it onto the foundation where all the permanent services are in your yard. So it ends up being about the same. It ends up usually being more expensive unless, unless you have very easy access and you can pretty much drop it right down on a slab. Mm-hmm. Um, in those cases, uh, it is more cost effective. But don't get the two people. People put them in two different baskets. They think prefabricated or custom. And I would look at it as a 500 square foot rectangle built off site or a 500 square foot rectangle built on site because you could design and and build on site a really really cheap looking manufactured style 412 or flatter roof not not cheap i just mean like affordable cheap right. you could build to the same exact standards in place for way cheaper than you could ever buy it the disconnect is that people don't build a you know a same square footage size architectural design as a manufactured home, which they should, you know, which they should. And and my, all my ADUs there, they could be a manufactured home. The only thing that differentiates them is I use a really steep roof because it looks different, but that's a great question. I'm I'm glad you asked that. And you have, if you have any follow-ups, just shoot. What about the stamped, um, like architect or civil engineer, who do I need to still hire? Like I can manage it myself basically, but who do I have to hire? Just, well, because manufactured it, home comes with plans, right? Well, but still the site work needs to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it does. But if you own the property in almost every jurisdiction, if you own the property and you don't intend to sell it, and definitely if you live on it, you can self manage. If it's at one of your investment properties across town, you may yeah. not be able to self manage it. And you may have to hire those portions out. But if you're using the house hacking strategy that I use and that I teach, um, you can self-general. I always uh, advise people to call their local building official and ask. We can't forget this, that like all these huge taxes that everybody's running away from California because they have to pay, all those tax dollars, those go to the municipalities to pay these people to help us. They work for the people, right? So don't feel bad when you call the the building official and say, hey, I want to build an ADU. I just saw SB8 and SB9 come out. Who would you point me to to help me decide if I can manage this project myself? Like, Don't feel bashful about asking the people that we're paying to help us. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. I think, Mike, do you have a question? I do. I have a few. Um, so, yeah, if anybody else wants to jump in, but uh, um, are you are you a California contractor? Do you do any of these ADUs here in the Bay Area? No, no. I'm licensed in, as a general contractor in the state of Oregon only. Okay. Do you recommend anybody here? Yes. Yeah, I do. I, I have contacts um, in a lot of markets. It's okay. believe it or not, uh, you know, I've, I've participated in um, several hundred ADU builds and they've all been uh, in in Oregon, but I've consulted with probably 2,500 builds nationwide. So I do have some contractors in my pocket. Um, I have a company that I partner with and they're exclusive in the Bay Area and in Southern California. And what they do is they help pair um, homeowners with vetted builders in their area that just do ADUs. And there's a link 
on my website. I can drop it in the show notes, but the the company is Realm. So realmhome.com. And if you mention, they're an affiliate uh, of mine. I partner with them. I get a small kickback. Uh, but if you mention that ADU guy, you save a hundred dollars and their, their basic product is, is a $500 refundable deposit. So they bring you like three different bids for your project. And if you choose to go with one of their builders, they give you that $500 back. Okay. Um, if you use that ADU guy, you can save a hundred bucks. They're the only person I partner with. And the reason I partner with them is they don't do the work. They just are a data mining company that find you the highest rated, most affordable builders for your project. And it's an amazing system because it's it's really what I do. People call me all the time and ask me for referrals to to good builders. And if you're in you know Santa Cruz or if you're in um, Los Angeles or if you're in um, you know South Bay, I know some personally. Um, but yeah, I, I would look at Realm, and I have a an affiliate link that'll save you a hundred bucks if you're interested. Okay, I, market, I'll that to you later. I've got a bunch. Yeah, so, what yeah. what market exactly are you in, Mike? I'm in Contra Costa County. So okay, I'm what's like Antioch, Brentwood, Oakley. Okay. But I, yeah. I do, I do other, you know, I do Alameda and Contra Costa all over. Okay. So, but one I, thing I, primary rentals are out here. So awesome. Awesome. And, you know, back to my original advice of like going to, you know, I, I always tell people to go to a lumber yard closest to the build site, the geographic closest location possible, because as contractors, like we're creatures of habit, and the we have a small home range. We really do. And the closer you can get to the build site, the higher chances you have of getting a good contractor that's reliable and in your area. And what makes them part of what makes them reliable is they're close. Yeah. So something to to consider. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Um, what else you got, the, Mike? Uh, zoning. Um, yeah. I've I've kind of I've built up about thirty four long term rentals over time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've, and I've kind of focused on small multifamily, you know, two to nine, but uh-huh. I bought a lot of legal non-conformings. So okay. I think I'm going to kind of be out of luck on those legal non conforming Like one of them is a five unit and it used to be a church and yeah. they, you know, they, it, they built the high school and it didn't, it wasn't a main thoroughfare anymore and everybody's shutting is, them down. It's a five unit now. Is, is the city calling it illegal non-conforming or are they calling it? Like, do you, do you have certificate of occupancy for each of those five units or do you have do. a commercial building with an illegal existing use? No, no, they're all legal grandfather. Okay. They're all okay, 1920s and 1930 builds. Awesome. But, you know, they were, and zoning all came into place in the fifties and sixties out here. Uh huh. But you know, it's, I, I've been told some of these, like if, so if something burned down, I might not be able to rebuild. You know, that's a really, that's, that's a really good question. And and I can speak intelligently to that. I was a planning commissioner here in my town and in September of 2000, we, uh, 2020, September 8th, we had the Almeida fire come through and it burned down 3000 structures. And this is two cities of like 10,000 people. So it burned down over half of our town. And a lot of the areas that had been zone changed or that had been um, grandfathered in or that there were moratoriums on different uh, types of spot zoning, they had to fight really hard to get those rights back. So that's a really good question. I, I would talk to my insurance agent to see that I was insured properly. And I would talk to potentially a land use attorney in relation to your city planner to see how you can best protect yourself, because that would suck if you have you have a generating income stream of five units and it burns down and they tell you, you can, you can put one or, or, yeah, I mean, or and, something. And I've got insurance. It's more, you know, am I going to get permission to build ADs there? I mean, I kind of, I've kind of, I've been buying properties that almost had ADs on it before that was perfect. Really. You know, like, I mean, That's I've, awesome. got, I've got one I'm refinancing with Bo right now. The second unit on it was I've got the permit copy. It was permitted in 1951. That's I mean, awesome. like $1,500 to build this, you know, this little cottage in the back. Mm-hmm. And so it's legal. It's got its own pg e meter, you know, separate, you know, gas and electric. It just doesn't have separate water. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's cool. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a great question. I, I would be, I would be talking to the, to the city about that. I mean, it yeah. tells, well, I'm thinking if it's a church, it's probably in a commercial zone and you'd be lucky to even build a, re, a residential structure if you lost it. So but it's all, it's all, that's all a street, a single family, but there's a bunch of little multis on it. Cause they mm. were, that was the center of town in, in the 1930s and forties. And then in the 1950s, they, 
eminent domain didn't build a high school. So okay. like, you've got wow. 17th streets cut off from the other side of 17th street. And there's, just, you know, three schools there. It was back before we had good professional planning. They're just like, yeah, yeah I'll give it to the school district, whatever. Yeah. No, it's, it's the bulk of, you know, I've got more legal non-conformings than I have single families anymore. I sold the single families off. Because Did you buy it? when you bought those and you went through title and you, and you, you saw that they were clear, but weird. Did you get, was there like a, a, a discount because you were buying these kind of like these, these one-off styles? Cause I it sounds like you I, have a little bit of risk. You're like, you're, you, it sounds like you're worried of a little risk. Did, was that priced into the deals when you bought them? Oh no, I, I, you know, I'm, I feel comfortable. I've got the insurance coverage. I've gone mm-hmm. through that discussion. I just, I would like to build more. I think some of these have space to do it. Yeah, well, the, the, over, the overall answer that I would give you is that California has the most friendly infill housing anywhere right now. I mean, on the heels of SB8 and SB9, I would call your city. I mean, I would I would ask, hey, what is the greatest? This is another good tip that I've used over the years is you, you get a hold of the, the planner or the deputy planner or even the community development director if you can. And you say, hey, I've got these five non-conforming or, or legal existings. Uh, what is the greatest and best use of this property? What would you do if you if it was yours to add more mm-hmm. units? And when you tell them that like, hey, I respect you and you're probably the smartest person in the room, which they usually are. And you ask them like, what would you do if this was yours? A lot of times they'll just like give you like, you know, the golden pathway to, to adding more units. Cause really that's what the bleeding hearts want. That's what investors want. That's what tenant wants. It's a win-win for everybody if we can add housing except for the the not in my backyard neighbors they don't like it but oh yeah I, them, I would deed restrict something to affordable or section eight or whatever yeah I've, yeah I've totally triplex that already is deed restricted that way they it was actually they got permission instead of building three moderate single family homes they remodeled a triplex in the middle of downtown and and got that and now and the city said the city said yes you can do that but give us this yeah and it's deep years. restricted you know until you know for the next 40 years but yeah i i've got all section eight in there paying 24 50 a month on each unit so good. and i bought it from the builder when they wanted to start ramping back up so nice. i mean I, I love this space i just i would love to build up some more units on and uh yeah i wanted to see if you had any experience with that yeah. Yeah. And if you want to hit me up offline, we can look more yeah. into it, but yeah, you're, you've, you've got, I mean, you're way ahead of most, you're, you're way ahead of most of your peers. And for other people in this group, if Mike's in your neighborhood and you want to build your first ADU or you want to buy your first ADU, that's legal non-conforming, there might be an expert right down the street that you could have coffee with. So that's why these meetings are cool. Cause we're here to help everybody. Oh yeah. So hit, no, and hit, I need to reach out to you that. That, yeah, yeah, definitely that, uh, the metering thing. I, I need to connect with you off that offline on that. That was solved. Yeah some major yeah. rubs issues for me. So cool. yeah, that's cool. Worth, uh, just right there. Yeah. And they're getting better every day. I just, I just found a new badger water meter and they're like Bluetooth. You can like put all these private meters in and they just like send to a, an app on your phone. It's, it's pretty cool. Awesome. Um, Raymond, you got something? Yeah. So um, for me, um, my situation is uh, I would like to build a ADU on my primary. Um, I, I got a good size lot. And I, I don't really utilize my backyard to its fullest potential. But um, my, my thing is, uh, I guess, I don't really have too much space for, um, you know, to any construction trucks or anything to go back there and, and build anything like too massive or um, between my property line and my neighbors. Um, mm-hmm. I really only got space on my right hand side. The, <clears throat> on the left hand side, there's not like there's only a few feet. So I guess my question is um, two twofold. Um, one, like what would be the best approach to build something in a situation like that? And then also, <clears throat> does it in your experience, um, do you find that like you know it, it's an issue where? Uh, it's a situation where like, let's say you build an ADU and then um, you have a tenant or something and they find themselves having to walk a good amount from like (laughs) where the driveway would be um, in order to just get to their house. Because honestly, there wouldn't be no way for them to kind of drive up to like the front of the property. They will like have to park in my driveway and then kind of walk around the side of my house in order to get to it. Like, would that make sense to do it at that point? 
It makes perfect sense. You know, I, I did a video on this recently because I get that call a lot and, and people, again, they, they like that. They, they pay for three things, location, privacy, and amenities. And part of the privacy is walking back to the corner to be by themselves. So I have several ADUs where the parking for the ADU is in front of the primary house. Uh, one of them, they walk 150 feet. I just built an ADU wow. recently on a property. On the property I'm actually at right now, I'm, I'm in the downstairs garage, finished garage, which is my office, under a detached ADU. And across um, about 100, this one's about 120 feet from parking. In my area, you have to be able to park within 250 linear feet of the doorway. So I meet that easily, but that's why I always know the footage because I have to show it on the plot plan. But they park at the primary house. They walk 120 feet. You actually have to cross a Federal Bureau of Reclamation irrigation canal, a six foot wide by 20 foot long bridge that I built that took me two years to get the permit for to, to get the, to this place. So you park, you have to walk 120 feet across a moat. And I built it there and we it cost me $5,000 roughly. $5,000 extra to build that house. And every single piece of lumber was carried 120 feet over that bridge included everything, the ridge beam, the concrete. I had to pay a little bit more. I had to get two concrete pumps because you can only pump concrete to about 200 feet, depending on the slump. So we can pump concrete through, and this is all documented on my YouTube channel if you want to see how we did it, but we can pump concrete. Uh, we can't do a truss roof because you can't crane them back there usually. So we did a stick built in uh, a stick frame roof built in place. And the, the hardest piece to get back there was the ridge beam. The ridge beam for that vaulted ceiling was 30 feet long. It was a eight and a half by 17 and a half inch beam. And it was about 1400 pounds. And it took 11 of us to carry it back there, but everything could be done. I, I hired labor ready. When I'd get my material drops, I would just hire a labor outfit to come and, and hand pack it all back there. And between the extra concrete pumps and the extra labor to carry literally every roof shingle and every stick of lumber and every stick of siding over there was about $5,000. So it was a little more money, but that that narrow side yard of, of five feet is plenty to get all your material back there and know your tenant does not mind parking in front of your house and walking back there. I mean, that's kind of the cool cottage backyard living anyways. Um, ideally in a perfect world, would we, if we had a choice to drive up and park at the ADU or walk a hundred feet, we'd probably all choose to drive that hundred feet back there and park at it, but it is not a deal killer. Um, I do, usually I do a, a, um, a flagstone pathway and then I plant grass around it so I can just mow over it. It's really easy maintenance, but it's this nice kind of charming walk out to the ADU and people love it. So don't let that, don't let that scare you away. Other creative ideas are, could you, you know, pay for your neighbor's fence if he let you take down a section of it and use that for construction access? Could you, you know, um, you know, could you, could you negotiate with your neighbor to have some access if you had to things like that, get creative. Okay, cool. Um, I appreciate that. And then, um, lastly, I was going to ask, um, do you have any, uh, contacts out in, in Florida? What part of Florida? South Florida, Central Florida? Uh, Central, Central Florida. No, but I, I have people in my network, but I, I can't say like, yeah, I call Bob or Sarah, but I do have people in my network. Um, you can connect with me offline and um, I'm not thinking of anybody off the top of my head. I know a couple of big investors and I know a couple of developers there and they would have contacts for builders that they know, like, and trust. And that's another good talking point on network is it's not just like, we don't have to know everything. We just have to know who to call to get the answers we need. So I think it be thinking like who, not how. Okay. Jason has a question in the, uh, the chat. I'm finishing up a flip that I was hoping to keep, but I'd be in into it too much to burr. And for people that don't know what burr is, it's buy, renovate, uh, rent, refinance, repeat. Uh, yard is big enough for a DADU, which is a detached ADU. How would I underwrite the property to account for a detached ADU? Um, and I think what he's saying is uh, he's hoping to keep it, but it sounds like he doesn't, have, as a market went down, he doesn't have enough room. So now he's thinking, can I build an ADU? I think that's what you're saying. Jason, is that what you're saying? <coughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, just getting over a cold but yeah um that's yeah that's you read that right that's what i'm saying it's like if if i could 
build a property and uh, detach ADU on it. Um, and uh, yeah, and then kind of re underwrite it and see if I could, you know, uh, refinance out of it and recoup most or, you know, most of my money back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, I mean, my, my first inclination when I read, when I read that was like finishing up a flip and hoping to keep it, but you might be in too deep to burr it. Um, my thought would be to like, look for any pre-approved ADU plans that your city might have. And like, since you're already working there, if you've already pulled permits and you have a relationship with them, you could just say, Hey, um, I'd like to just plot this and pay the permitting fees. And then you could sell that, just get out of it. You know, if the market's shifting, you're already in too deep. Don't go take on, don't like double down on your losses, but maybe if it's easy and there's pre-approved ADU plans, um, get them paid for and permitted. So you can market that with the house. Hey, brand new house. I just flipped it. It's got all new infrastructure, beautiful new backsplash. And I have pre-approved plans for an ADU out back. Like that's just going to set you apart in the market. If you did maybe decide to keep it and you could come up with some more money, what I would do is I would come up with a simple, affordable set of ADU plans and I would take them to a reputable area appraiser or two and ask them if you could pay them for their time for a market opinion of value on your plan set. Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Appraiser, I'm going to build this ADU plan set at this address where I'm flipping the house. What's your opinion of value? And if they say based on recent comps and comparable sales and whatever they tell you, um, offer to pay them because this isn't a job from the bank. This isn't coming from the mortgage company. This is you're paying them directly. Hey, I'll pay you $200 to do this. It could be the best $200 you could ever spend because they could say, hey, this is going to maybe add $80,000 of value to the to the house. And you spec it out real quick with your contractor who's flipping your house. And he says it's going to cost $150,000 to build that $200 you just spent was great money because you would have been upside down a lot if you would have just doubled down on your losses. So I don't know your situation at all, but like if you're just finishing up a flip and you don't think you're going to be able to burr it, I wouldn't like dig a, the, the deeper hole. I would just get out of it or try to get out of it with this shiny little object in the backyard of a potential permitted ADU. Um, but if you really did want to keep it, get a professional opinion of value from somebody in that market. So you know what you're up against. If if he says, Hey, you build that ADU in that corner of that property right there on that street, it's going to be worth 200. And your builder saying you can do it for 150. That might be the $50,000 of equity that makes you able to hold that whole deal. And if your goal is to have long-term build and holds, then maybe this does put you over the edge. So that's kind of the the way I would answer that. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. All right. We got Luna has typed a question because she couldn't get her audio. Okay. I decided I want to own an income property as a way to supplement re my retirement in the future. I am still working, but retirement is maybe 10 years away. Although I'd love it to be less. Exclamation point. Anyway, I bought my home in Edmonds, Washington that has a basement room that I am turning into an ADU. I am now awesome. I am now in the middle of a renovation. I can see light at the end of the tunnel. I will use the tips on connecting with power company and permitting company. I already added a separate power panel for the unit. I'm also creating a great walkway to the back door and expanding the concrete bad and retaining walls that are part of the unit. I will just need to do something about the deck above because it's, it causes a lot of debris down to what will be the front door of that unit it's not really a question uh then she says i am con confused confused by financial stuff but i was able to get a renovation loan and an additional credit line still a lot of work left to do but i am so excited seems like you're on the right track we don't have to answer any questions i just would say she's a she's an action taker i like it that's awesome um good for you get it done i mean the 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 hardest part of an ADU conversion, especially basement, basements are hard. The hardest part of pretty much any build is to just start. So the fact that you're halfway through, um, you go girl. Like, and Luna, awesome. so Luna followed up and she said, yes, yeah, so you can reach out to um, that ADU guy. He's going to provide his contact information again. You can reach out to me for financing. I can definitely help you with, on that section. Um, but yeah, um, you can definitely. Um, so yeah, if you, 
I think if you listen uh, to Derek's um, early on, what he was talking about is, look, he didn't go out and have to buy all these investment properties. He bought properties that had, um, they, he wasn't even look, getting off market deals. He was really getting deals that he saw that he could do his value add component to it. And then he would move in, he'd get high leverage conventional financing, 95, 97%. He would do his value add by doing a junior ADD, ADU or detached ADU. He'd then live in there for a year or whatever he needed to. He'd rent it out. Now he's got both units or maybe even the third unit if he's doing it. And then he would go and buy and do it, the same thing over and over again. And really, you don't need that much money, right? Like if you, if you're, if you go and try to buy a property as an investor and you're getting like a DSCR or conventional non-owner occupied loan, you need 25% down. What he's doing is the house hack way, right? And I always tell people, this is like, everybody makes it so complicated. If you just did this like five times over the next 10 years or five years, that's probably pretty close to your, your covering all your monthly outgo. We, we call that being a hundred percenter. So like, I mean, and then if you, you know, supercharge with appreciation and everything, I think that's the way to go. So I think Luna's follow-up question was like, now, when she's done with that, you shouldn't stop because you got 10 years or so. What if you could buy one more property and do that? And now you can retire in five if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. You just basically stole my whole presentation in a better way in three minutes. Like just what he said. That's that's it. It's all I've ever done. One at a time. I've lived in every single one of them. You know, uh, I, I have 15. I'm about to have 20. I haven't lived in all 15, but I've lived in the primary of each one of those properties. And to, to make it a little more, um, not like flashy, but we've just taken the, the house hack and turned it into the land hack. So now what we're doing is the same thing. But when we, we buy the house that can have an attached and detached ADU, but when we buy the house, it's got to be on a big enough lot that we can legally do a lot of record split, do a minor land partition, and then I'll build a house and two ADUs behind it. So it sounds like, oh man, you move all the time. Doesn't everybody hate it? Well, not really, because most of the time we just move into the backyard into a brand new house that's just like the one that we built a year ago. So it's kind of like the system is is so boring. It's it's never changed, but that's why um, it, it's easy. Like when I started getting really bored doing what I was doing, I was like, I finally made it. Like I, I finally made it. And I will say to your point too, that the no deal thing, I just did a um, I did an Instagram reel on it maybe last week or two weeks ago, but I just bought a house, the only house that I've ever bought that will not cash flow. It goes against most of my criteria. I like to try to buy um, 1960 and newer, and it's a 1954 house. It doesn't cash flow. Um, it needs everything. I'm going to replace the sewer system. I'm going to replace the drain lines, the water lines, the HVAC system. The roof's good. That's the only thing that's not replaceable. And I made this video just saying, hey, this is the only alligator I've ever bought. And the only reason I bought it is because this, it actually comes with this corner lot and it's in a historic district downtown. Um, so I overpaid for a place that's not going to cash flow, but it comes with a free lot. And I'm going to take a set of plans that I've built several times for the house and a set of plans I've built several times for the ADU. And I'm going to build the house in the ADU on this lot that's already split. I don't have to pay for surveying. I don't have to pay for infrastructure. It's already legally split. The water meter's there. The sewer tap is there. The power's right there. So the savings was in the anomaly that I saw that nobody else saw. It wasn't a good deal. And that's how I buy all my properties. They're all, you know, this is actually probably the worst deal I've ever bought, but they're all like that. They're, they're not a good deal. The deal is we make them. And I always put these on and I bring these to every conference I go to is, is kind of a joke, but people are like, what the hell are those? And I tell people, these are my ADU goggles and I want you to have them too. And so what I do with these goggles is I, I just have a different view of the property. I have a different view of the house. Um, I have a different view of, of the land and the possibilities to infill that land. And none of this is special powers. I mean, the goofy goggles is just to show you like, I'm just a goober just like anybody else, I just got a niche and you guys can use the niche too. So become an expert in your local zoning code, um, build relationships with the people that have done what you want to do in your area and build relationships with the decision makers and the planning and zoning and building offices. Cause that really is, um, you know, where the rubber meets the road. That's awesome. 
Any last questions? I know it's getting late here. I think this was uh, fantastic. We didn't have a huge turnout, but it was a very powerful group here of action takers. So uh, anyways, next week we have an event on the 22nd. I encourage you to all come to that. It's going to be really good. Uh, we, we've got uh, Derek's information. I highly recommend you follow his Instagram and YouTube because a lot of stuff he brought up today, you're going to get you're going to see the, 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 you know, the 10 or 15 minute video behind it. And, and it's going to teach you a lot. And cause he, when I met with him for the first time a few months ago, I'm like, man, this is cool. This is what I need to do here in Vegas. When I get my next property, I got to think, I got to put my ADU goggles on and, and, and do it. Right. Cause now I'm going to be getting the cash flow. Cause that's really the key. If you're buying in a West coast market, you need to figure this part out. This is the game changer here. So super excited. Thank you so much, Derek, for, joining us your your wealth of information and uh happy to call you my new friend just recently for about four months now but you're uh you're you're a really awesome dude uh with a lot of information love following you on social too because you you do you do fun stuff too not just real estate he's run he what do you do ultra marathons snowboard everything. yeah yeah i'm always skiing or trying to run 100 miles at a time or do something wild doing a cold plunge in the local Creek in the middle of winter. I try to just share what I'm doing. You know, some people, their social media, they have all this stuff stored up and they like schedule and release it all the time. I just pull out my phone and record what I'm doing and share it with people. And I found, you know, over a little bit of time that people just like seeing what other people are doing, you know, it's human nature. I think Mike has one last question. Oh no, I was just oh. uh, coming back on to, to say goodbye to everybody here, okay. but, um, Oh, hey, you know, I did. I did have one. Um, do you know, has has uh, the new ADU laws here in California, has it changed where one of the units has to be owner occupied? I believe it still is. If you do, and, and I'm, I'm hesitant to be an expert on this because I'm not an expert on California zoning code in your city. I'm just not. But <laughs> yeah. what um, is what's coming to mind for me is the the owner occupancy on the J ADU and then also some owner occupancy requirements. If you take that Cal half a $40,000 grant. Okay. So it's, it's wrapped up in a couple of different things. And the last I heard the state had a stance on it and some of the cities weren't enforcing it. So I would say get very, very specific on your question to your local authority having jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I looked at it like three or four years ago and it was a no go, but the laws changed. And you can just, I haven't read it. Mike, you could just move into the property. Why not? Yeah. You know, you exactly. just, you're just adding a couple hundred, you're adding two grand a month of cash flow right there or more. Right. So you can oh, just absolutely. do it. Oh, I plan on house hacking some. Absolutely. But no, I, I have, I have one property and across the street, they, um, it had an illegal ADU on it. They, it was a it was a professional flipper that came in with permits. They turned it into a real ADU and they sold it off. I mean, as almost like an assisted living play. And mm. and I and I couldn't believe what they listed for and they got it. So I mean there's they a strategy. Have, they had to have some knowledge there. And I just I haven't bothered to go educate myself on it. So I, I'll go talk to some people. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a real estate investor with properties and you're trying to figure out how to refinance or grow your existing real estate business? Need some clarity and a game plan for moving forward? I'm offering a free strategy call where we dive deep on your real estate investing goals. I'll help you come up with a strategic finance plan that will help you get to where you want to go. Whether you've got a portfolio of 30 properties or you're starting out with your first property, I have a framework that has helped many investors grow. If you're interested, book a call below in the Calendly link. Last question. Last question. I promise you. What? What's? How are appraisers valuing ADUs now? Is there any kind of like, have we made any headway? I know we were having a lot of issues in the past where they weren't mm -hmm. really, they didn't know how to yeah. value it. I mean, what's the yeah. way, how do you approach your, your refinances? Yeah, great question, Bo, especially coming from a lender. Linder said it'll it'll appraise it'll be fine. Um, you know it depends on the market. If you're in Portland, Oregon, where they've been established as cash cows for two decades, you're going to get full value every time. Bam. If they just allowed ADUs last year 
in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you're like the fifth ADU to ever be built in the city, prepare to get hosed. And as a, a general rule, I say to conservatively underwrite your accessory dwelling unit square footage value at 75% of the square footage value of the house. So if your house values at $300 a square foot, you build a nice new ADU that you don't overbuild that's built to the neighborhood standard, you should get 75% of that minimum. You should get 100% of it, period. But I always go 75% to be safe. The trick here and very, very detailed is you need to build the ADU to the same finishings of the house. Don't build a super custom jewel box in the backyard of your track house. You're not going to get the values. So just keep that in mind. If you're in a you know, median price point neighborhood, build your ADU to median price point materials. When does it make sense to convert uh, uh, the garage to an ADU and and then like maybe do a detail and then put like a tough shed, like, you know, one of those prefabbed if, uh, garages? Does it ever make sense to do that? Because uh, yeah. it's yeah, just it easier and cheaper to, to, to convert the garage and then just easier and cheaper to get a tough shed garage detached? Yes. Yes, totally. Uh, it's the, the the play to do that is when you're you know a new investor. This could be your first rental property. It's close to the sewer, and you can meet the parking standard. Got it. If there's a bathroom ever in your garage or in your detached garage, like all bets are off, and it's go time. Like the the toilet is the hardest part of the ADU. So any structure that has a toilet already in it. A shower is a slam dunk. That's only an inch and a half line. A tub is only a two inch line. It's the three inch line that you can't connect into those smaller lines. So if anything ever has a toilet in it, an ADU is going to be super easy. How do you that's figure? The, that's the hardest part. For us people with soft hands, meaning we never built anything. We don't know anything about construction. We know real estate a little bit, but how do we know? Like, what's the, like, what's the process to figure out how, where the sewer lines are? Like, if you're, if you're not a builder, right? What do you, do you recommend getting a builder there? Or like, are we looking for, yeah. for the clean outs? How are we, how are we yeah. best understanding that part, part of it? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So if, if you're not a builder or you're not a plumber, um, this is a clean out. This is a four inch 30, 34 PVC with a four inch cap. And per code, we've got to have one of these within five feet of the exterior of our building where our sewer line goes out to the street. And so they can stick a snake in there and clean it out. Um, a lot of times these are buried in the ground. It's hard to find them. But if you can walk through a house, I tell everybody when you get a house under contract, do these two things. Walk through the house and the potential ADU space with a licensed general contractor in your area that's built ADUs because they can tell you what to look out for, what's going to be easy, what's going to be expensive, and then always scope your sewer. So it's about $200 in my market. It's probably twice that in the Bay Area. But a plumber will come out and they'll put a high definition camera I call it a turd's eye view. They'll put a high definition camera down this pipe and they're not only looking down your pipe, they're looking for root intrusion, they're looking for degradation, they're looking for um, a crushed part of your pipe, but they're also sonding it. They take a machine and they can see where it at, where it is in the ground based on the locate. And more importantly to that, they can find out how deep it is. So our sewer line has to be on a quarter of an inch per foot. Okay, if it's too steep, all the waste, the solids are going to outrun the water. And if it's too flat, the, the waste isn't going to flow downhill. So sewer is very, I mean, it's a very methodical process. It's got to be a quarter of an inch a foot, 2% grade. So if the sewer line is on one side of your house and it's only eight inches deep and 60 feet away is the garage, you don't have enough gravity 2% fall to let your waste come to the sewer. So you're going to have to put in a pump station. You're going to have to put in a grinder pump. You're going to have to put in designated 30 amp exterior circuit to power that pump. And it's, that could be a five or $10,000 deal breaker right there. So that's why the sewer is so important. If you have a bathroom in the building, you're wanting to convert, you don't have to worry about any of this crap. I mean, you could still have an Orangeburg pipe or a cast pipe or a pipe with root intrusion. You should still always scope your pipe. The reason we do that is because if we have a house under contract and we put a camera down the pipe and we see problems, the seller is going to pay for it. If we close because we were too cheap to pay $200 to get a sewer scope done and the toilet backs up and the next thing you know, the bathtub's full of turds and we have a $15,000 bill and that's on us. So good, good points. Good questions there. Yeah. I would, now that gives me kind of some good talking points. So 
we're always we always want to scope because we also want to see the grade because if we need to if we need to tie in sewer and it, the grade's not right you're gonna have to you know pump the shit up the hill essentially yes. and that's yes. another cost another expense yes um, so it's so just it's really, one more thing yeah yeah you have a playlist on your YouTube where you walk through like all this stuff. That'd be kind of good. Yeah. Could... Yeah. I just, I just did a, a sewer scope um, video last week on my YouTube shorts. You know, it's, it's all on there. I've got 260 videos, everything that people pay me for in consultation time. If, if you want to pay me and talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I have a consultation rate. It's free for first time buyers. So if you're trying to buy your first house, you get my super high valuable high dollar. It sounds arrogant, but it's true. Like, I, I don't have a lot of time, but I, I donate my time for free to first time buyers. And then I have a rate for homeowners and then I have a rate for investors, but all the stuff, pretty much everything people pay me for on one-on-one -on -one consult time, you can see for free. If you follow me on all those sites, cause I just, op everything I do, I open source. So if you call me and you both, you're like, Hey, what's that thing about sewer? I'm not going to explain this over to you. I just send you a link of a YouTube video of us doing a sewer scope and I'm talking about it. That way I don't have to answer the, there's about a hundred questions that I get every day and I can just send a link to somebody. I don't have to keep saying the same thing. That's pretty smart. I have to well, do it's the not, same. What's not smart is it took me like 15 years of getting those same questions before yeah. I was like, Hey, if I recorded this, I could only do it once. It took me 15 years to figure it out, but whatever. I'm a slow learner. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I was just at a class today here in Las Vegas on Airbnb rules, which is crazy here. Uh, you know, between Las Vegas and and then Henderson, and then you have unincorporated Clark County. It's you know, and so we have all like same thing with ADU rules. We have the city of Henderson. We have ADU rules for uh, actually Las Vegas, and then the unincorporated parts. I, I most likely will, will be buying in the un, unincorporated parts. Um, so that's why I got to study that portion of the ADU law. To figure out what Good. I need to do. Yes. So, Become so already, an expert in your local zoning code. Yeah. So I already Googled it and uh, I did find that information. And then the good thing is, is I know I could go get your videos. And then if I'm like lost, I could pay for a consultation, which would be worth it to me. I'd probably get it for free because I'm friends with you and I had to yeah. buy a steak dinner. But if I wasn't friends with you, you know, I would pay for it. So yeah, no, no that's my favorite. <laughs> I, lo I love my all my real estate friends. I get to buy them free steak dinner and give them consults. Yeah, of course, thank you. Anybody can call me, you know, yeah. I have my phone number, like on my website, on the top, that phone number is, is this phone, like, and it rings all the time. And I probably get, I don't know, maybe, maybe three to five calls a week of somebody that just says, I didn't think you were going to answer your phone. And I'm like, yeah, how can I help you? And they don't even have a question. They just call the number because they don't think anybody will answer. So I, I just <laughs> tell people, like, if you call me, be ready to take action. That's like my only request. Like, don't call me and say, I can't believe you answered and then not have an ADU question for me because I'll pull my hair out. I have a feeling Luna is going to be calling you because she, she uh, couldn't get her. She's like, she's really excited. And <laughs> she, uh, oh, she's laughing. She's, yeah. she's with us in text. Yeah. Luna, Luna, you can call me like anybody who's like, I'm kicking ass and I'm halfway done with the basement conversion. And I'm going to do it can call me any day. So yeah, and then you can film it and you can, you can do a, a Instagram reel. Again, it's it's about, it's about helping each other. Like somebody might have heard something Mike said and know, knows that Mike's down the street or heard something that Bo said, and maybe he can fund this reach out like these 10,000 pound phones that we don't want to like pick up and call for help, like use them. That what that's what networking is all about. And you know, it's a team sport. Real estate's a team sport. Elena has one more question. Shoot. She, in the comments, she said, um, what about combustible toilets? Uh, composting toilets are, yeah. If, a composting toilet is like a last ditch effort. If you're, um, if you're in, a if you're outside of a municipality so if you're in a municipality you're in a city think street uh, sidewalks street lights water and sewer so a lot of areas outside of the incorporated areas have septic systems and the septic system is like a 2000 gallon holding tank and when we build a house outside of the city limits we have to put in a well and a septic and we never build very rarely do we build a septic that's way bigger than the house if you're going to build a 3-2 house, you put in a 1,500-gallon septic system. 
So the rules for adding another bedroom, uh, it's not based on drain fixture units, DFU, or it's not based on toilets. It's literally based, most septic code is based on bedrooms. So if you're building an ADU in the county, they're going to say you can't build an ADU unless you upgrade your septic system. You cannot put another bedroom or toilet on that system. And those are the times where I have seen people use composting toilets. There's multiple different models. They range anywhere from $500 to $5,000. You can plug them in. You can add wood chips. Some of them you dump back guano into. There's a million different organisms that make those things not stink. But everyone I've ever seen or heard about people using stinks. They just, they're not, they're not super efficient. If you're if you have like 10 acres out in the boondocks out in the desert and you go out there twice a year, like it would be awesome. But if you're trying to get $2,500 a month for rent and there's a composting toilet, I think it could be hard. Another, um, another like trick to that would be if it's like, Oh, it's a basement and I don't want to pump the sewage. You can get these extractor, uh, pumps that actually are powered by the water in the tank of the toilet. So it just depends on the situation. If if you're if you need a self composting toilet because there's no capacity for sewer anywhere, that's one thing. If you're like, should I put a composting toilet in my basement? I'm going to say no. Your house is going to stink. Um, consider a different route. Yeah, one thing I can say about that, I've done a septic to sewer conversion, and I just I didn't have an option to upgrade that. Um, that septic without doing it above ground, which is a big, ugly mess. That's very expensive. So that's a zoning thing I've ran into here in California. If anybody's around here. Oh yeah. That's if you can ever connect to public utilities, do it. Like that's, oh, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. If you can ever abandon your septic tank and hook in the city, you ever see the city putting big old main line down the street. That's when you go talk to the contractor and say, who do I got to talk to to tee into this? Yep. And I might have to ask you on sewer ejector pumps too. I've got one that's a mess and below grade in that little church that uh, it's working for now, but yeah, I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. Just tell them no wet wipes or tampons. Uh, Easier said than done to tenants, but yes. Yeah. I just, I just had that happen. My, uh, the, the tenant was complaining about their toilet back, uh, you know, uh, it was leaking and then the pipes filled out. This is a house I own in Pennsylvania. And then so they were clearing out the the sewer line because it's flooded everywhere. And there's like pound, there's like piles and piles of wet wipes, right? And then the the plumber said, Did you put wet wipes down this thing? And she they said, No, we never have. And it's like they've lived there for four or five months. It would have back, it would have it, it's definitely them, you know. And it sucks because yeah. they're like they're 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 section eight. Um, and they don't have much money. So I had to put them up in a hotel. But I don't I don't I don't feel like that's my responsibility really cuz they should they did something they shouldn't have, right? But I don't know the laws and everything, so I I, I mean yeah, I have do, a heart. I have a heart Yeah, too. do the right yeah. thing. Keep your tenants, get them back in there, just say don't don't ever do that again. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I've, I've had a uh let's see a baby bottle nipple and uh and toys. So yeah. yes, yeah, we, it's uh it's no fun. I mean, but, but at the end of the day, like if they're section eight, right, I'm getting and it's subsidized or voucher. It's like, am I expected to, to and I don't know, I could actually research this, like, because, you know, I, I spent four hundred eighty three dollars putting them in a hotel for a few days. Plus, I have to fix I'm going to spend fifteen hundred dollars fixing this. And it's really not my fault right now. If I call insurance, if you do claims on your insurance, what happens? Then that your insurance raise your premiums. Yeah, nobody ever wants to give you insurance anymore. Yeah. Get canceled, and I carry five thousand deductibles anyway because I never use the insurance. So it's all it's all it's all kind of a scam. Yeah, I mean, in California, you don't have to necessarily place the tenant, but then you can't collect that rent either. So it's just it's like you're kind of you might as well do the right thing and then get to keep charging it. That's what I do with Section Eight every time. Yeah, so it's I the mean, right I, thing to do. you know, it, why lose a tenant and just feel good about it, you know? Well, yeah, yeah. And that's what I did. I mean, I'm a good person, but also like, you know, if, if, if stuff like this happens all the time, it's like, you got to be very clear going forward. I think in your leases, you have to be very clear about certain things. I don't think I do a very good job of that. I think going forward is, is be very clear. Hey, if there's a lot of my properties right now, I'm getting nickel dime and dime with the, the maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the property management companies, like they're getting calls. Oh, well, we have this peeling thing. And, and it's like, 
you know, I don't know. I think, you know, is anybody putting something in their lease like for the first couple hundred dollars the tenant pays? I don't know. I'm just thinking that might be a good idea. But then they might not call on things and then the problem gets worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know my lease is that they're very clear about clogs and hair and and flushing things that aren't supposed to be flushed. But at the end of the day, if, if your tenants don't have capacity to take care of that problem, you just got to do the right thing and tell them to please don't do that again and try to educate them and just be the good dude you are. That simple. I have had some friends. I know some people that do um, the first 50 in the lease, the first $50 of year of repairs is on them. And then anything after that up to $200 at a time to just take care of and then send in a receipt. So they can kind of self-manage their place. Um, I know a couple people that do a rendition of that. I, I personally don't. I I kind of like maintaining the stuff, but it sucks to hear that you're getting nickel and dimed, man. That's another good reason to really focus on infrastructure. Instead of buying a hundred thousand dollar house, maybe buy a four hundred thousand dollar house. That's going to be less headache. Um, maybe buy buy one four hundred thousand dollar house as opposed to four one hundred thousand dollar houses because it's less. You know, again, it's less maintenance. We want the most amount of cash flow with the least amount of problems. Yeah, but I mean, and I'm, I'm sure that's your triplex out there. And it's, you know, I mean, I've ran into, well, could I have, well, it ended up being diagnosed as a flat sewer also. So it's like how much is 5% is 50% of the blame mine. And then there's always the argument of it being pre-existing. Oh, I, I didn't do that. It must've been the last tenant. Yeah, yeah. I've only been here a year. So yeah, it's- yeah, no- you're doing it the right way. I agree. Yeah. And I, I think, I think um, Derek has a great point. It's like, you know, these assets that I own far away, just get rid, you know, just get a couple and then add value to them where you're getting the cash flow. Like if I, if I did the ADU strategy, right. And I converted them to furnished rentals and I got for that ADU, I could normally get 1800, but it's a furnished ADU. Now I can get 2,900 a month you know in three month chunks right you're squeezing but i I do i do think there's a huge opportunity with section eight and mike i know you have a lot of section eight i just talked to a guy today he he has 26 rentals in um fort wayne indiana and he does mostly section eight and so i think there's huge opportunity with affordable housing they people need a place to live like there's like an abundance when I put in my like cheap fourplex in Pennsylvania, I get so many inquiries because like nobody can afford, you know, people can, there's a, the Walmart workers of the world need the five to $600 apartment units, the $700 apartment units, but I don't know. It's a, it's amazing. So I always kind of go back and forth. Like there's a need for it, but I don't know if it's the best asset to own. Right. Thanks again, folks. I'm going to run. I appreciate everybody. And I look forward to talking to you again and hopefully meeting you all in person one day. Hey guys, Bo Exine here. If you enjoyed what you saw, please subscribe to this channel. We talk all things financing. I've been in the lending industry for over 20 years and I'm happy to answer your questions and provide great content.